This is the Note Closer Show, where you get the latest developments in distressed note investing and learn the secrets of how you can control millions of dollars worth of property for pennies on the dollar. Get educated and entertained by someone who has closed thousands of deals and lives to support you in achieving the same. Now, here's your host, CEO of We Close Notes, Scott Carson. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Note Close Show. As always, Scott Carson, excited to be here today. And I'm honored to have a, a special guest uh, who spoke at Note Camp just recently, who did an amazing job talking about how to you know, kind of source and pitch commercial note deals. This guy's been a player in the distressed uh, real estate space for a while, specifically in notes. Uh, got a great background, and I'm really excited what we're going to talk about today. Just kind of talk about where the market's at. And uh, if you had a crystal ball, what he sees with all the different activity going on in the market right now. So we are honored to have uh, Michael Jimenez join us today. Good morning, Michael. How's it going today? Hey, good morning, Scott. Thanks for having me. It's a uh, another beautiful, sunny day here in South Florida, Fort Lauderdale. Um, happy to be on 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 this um, this this webinar with you or this call. Um, and yeah, we I am a um, you know all we do here at Exchange Loans. We solely focus on um, uh, helping y'all buy and sell loans and REO uh, from lenders. So let's let's talk about that. How does somebody get into buying loans from sellers? Let's talk about your background a little bit and how you kind of got where you're at yeah. today. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Let me fix my, uh, my headset here since, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, so the way I got into loans, you know, I, I, um, you know, I went to school for commercial real estate and finance, dual major, Florida State, which is why I, I got to rep the, the Florida State shirt. Um, you know, I got out, I, I started in brokerage, just like, you know, probably a lot of, a lot of your, 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 your viewers, your audience. I started in brokerage, uh, industrial pro, brokerage and development for the late, great Trammell Crow, uh, right? Not the actual, you know, senior trainer, the, the company, um, right before I got bought out by CBRE uh, back in 06, 05 and 06, yep. um, kind of knew the market was about to fall apart because I was like, hey, this is my first year out of school. <laughs> and I'm like getting way too much. Like this, this doesn't seem like it's, there's going to be a lot of like, a very good six, safe career plan. Yeah, with I was like, I paid a lot of right. money. Yeah, exactly. I, was like, I paid a lot of money for this education and all, all the fundamentals are, are kind of alarming here. So I went and got a job uh, with a, a really good uh, life insurance company uh, at the time known as uh, International Netherlands Group or ING. Um, you know, really big firm. I worked on the insurance side. Um, that later got split off between insurance and banking with the whole uh, European and uh, Dutch government bail-in, uh, or bail-out of those companies, sorry. Um, and then I went down, um, brought, my, brought my talents down to South Beach, uh, did some commercial mortgage brokerage for um, uh, 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 what's, what's, what's called a dust lender. It was Grand Bridge, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of bb and Started learning about uh, banking culture there. Uh, is, and learned a lot about DUS, direct underwriting, uh, direct underwriting servicer for the GSEs, Fannie, Freddie, um, and got exposure to everything outside of life colons. Um, and then, you know, started and sorry for the, the long ex explanation here. My, it's like 15 years now I've been in, in this industry. Um, and then we got, um, during the downturn, we got, or the, the recovery, sorry. Um, we got kind of ahead of the curve, started, uh, got into a CRE tech startup. Uh, down on South Beach, uh, it was um, later, it was a, a, a subsidiary or special uh, branch of um, Starwood and LNR, um, which later became auction.com and then TEDx and everything, you know, founded Rhenium Cap, and then we are now launching uh, exchange.loans, more specifically gotten a note sales in, in 2007 when I was at ING, I got uh, tagged in my first note sale, I, I got tagged in for uh, to manage a lot of legacy assets uh, that the life insurance company, because they kept buying um, annuity and insurance companies. Um, I got to manage our entire uh, Detroit portfolio uh, from 2007 to 2010. So, um, you know, note sales. <laughs> so I got, that's how I got the note sales. There you go. Now let's, for those of our listeners out there that don't understand um, maybe a little bit of lingo, can you just, can you just, you know, explain what a legacy asset is or, or legacy product is for a lot of these banks? Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's a really good question. So a lot of these, um, and that's a really important question when you look at banks, right? Because if you look at the last like 10, 20 years, there's been a massive consolidation of banks. So when these banks, you know, like, like WAMU got bought, right? 
and Wells Fargo um, got you know the, the the servicing rights and took over that portfolio. They just bought the legacy assets of that former um, that former entity, right? So legacy, it's like you know, like like your family legacy. A lot of times you're you're born into it, and you got to know, hey, how how do I make this work? Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, you can't just sell off your your family legacy, <laughs> but with yeah, notes, it, you can sell them off a lot easier. Yeah, well, and that's basically they're basically taking over a portfolio that they mm, didn't originate. Yes. Mm. yes. And then they're basically, and a lot of times they've taken it over at a, a very dis, deep discounted price of some sort. Yes. Uh, and so they got some flexibility in selling it. So yeah, legacy assets. I've, we, yeah, I remember the whole Washington Mutual going out of business, getting bought up. Same thing with like uh, World Savings getting bought up by, um, you know, Wells Fargo as well and all that Fleet, stuff. Fleet Bank. I mean, yeah. you know, we had Commerce Bank where I grew up uh, outside of Philly in South Jersey. Um, so there's, and, and that trend's not going to stop and we can kind of already see that right now. Um, you know, with just the, um, overexposure of CRE to total risk-based cap capital for a lot of the, uh, I would say mid to large tier banks, typically starting out usually a, a half billion in AUM assets under management, uh, all the way up to about, you know, 5 billion. And then you get to the, you know, the, the massive large national banks like BOA, Wells Chase, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, and that's the big thing is we always tell people, you're probably not going to buy a note from the top 10 banks out there, you know, you, you know, unless you're going to write a, a, a stroke of big check. Now, that's definitely residential side. They want to be probably a little bit. They've got their different departments inside the, uh, of the on the commercial side on the asset classes that might be a little bit more flexible. We bought some one off notes in the past from Wells Fargo and, and yeah. Capital One and um, U.S. Yep. Bank, you know, some of the. Yeah. Yeah, and so so that's a really good point because um, and, and we've got um pretty good um you know uh, contacts relationships there. I'm guessing when you when you went to Wells Fargo was it from Wells Fargo proper or from Retex? Wells Fargo Retex. Uh, it was Wells Fargo Wells Fargo multifamily originally. Ah, okay, okay. So yeah, so a lot, and, and so and, and I don't know exactly where you want to begin. Um, you know, walk through specifically focusing on bank CRE. Um, because every lender is different, right? Um, like you wouldn't probably approach a bank the same way you would approach, you know, Fannie and Freddie. Right. Um, a lot of the larger banks, once you get to a billion dollars and up, they typically have um, s uh, allocated uh, resources and talent um, and, um, you know, uh, I guess you can say processes to buy and sell notes. Um, you know, some guys like BOA, Merrill Lynch, they have an active uh, loan trading platform or whole loan trading platform where, you know, that that's where they go and they talk to, you know, heads of other banks and Wall Street, you know, Wall Street guys, you know, you're not going to get in there uh, as a broker, right? Or even, even as a loan sale advisor, um, you got to have scale, you got to have um, a pretty big platform. Uh, U.S. Bank, Capital One, uh, Fifth Third, uh, Wells is a little bit tougher because they have a lot of different little, uh, you know, sectors or, or fiefdoms, right? Yeah. yeah like you could go, go to Wells Fargo proper, it could be CNI loans at a different sector. Um, so, Typically, the larger they are, the more um, allocated staff and specific processes and platforms they have in place. Uh, U U.S. Bank, um, Capital One, they're selling they're selling almost quarterly. Um, some will sell monthly. Fifth Third usually sells. It's almost monthly, um, and they'll go direct. So that's probably one that you can get into if you know who to follow up with. Um, I would suggest to um, you know your brokers, if you, if you guys are investors and you're looking to do one-offs, primarily SFR, uh, one of four family uh, 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 mortgages, which I don't touch. I never touch anything qualifying, strictly commercial. Um, you know, always to entities, never to people. So I'm not, I'm not that guy, you know, trying to <laughs> get Nana out of, out of the, the widow out of her shoe. Right. Well, it's um, a whole different ball game. I mean, that's the thing is yeah, most of the banks yeah. will have that, that the SFR stuff, you know, securitized and it's, you're not going to really be able to pick, pick it apart, but the commercial side, especially getting in those uh, million plus balances, you know, yes, those yes. are the ones that they let, that they're spent time on. I've always found, I think one of the biggest strong points for a lot of investors is that sub that million below uh, balance sheet because it's kind of considered the small assets for the banks. A lot of times, that we'll see some pretty decent deals for your know, local investors to take advantage of. Yes, yeah, so that the, and that's man, you're you're you hit it right on the head, and that's what we know is because we spend a lot of times right. I'm not I'm not DebtX. You know, I worked for Auction.com for quite quite some time. We ran our own division there, our own valuation advisory division. That's kind of our claim to fame. We we saw about ten thousand deals come across our 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 platform. Um, and, you know, helped advise all of the you know, executives and sales. 
Um, what we noticed then, and even from Rhenium Cap, where we were specifically loan sale advisors, uh, to now running a platform after we've you know, done this for a long enough time and got exposure to uh, tech, is that million dollars, that's kind of where it's, that's where most of the funds, um, like, you know, pick a fund that goes to IMN, like directed capital, right? A lot of these guys have a ton of their investor cash, and they also have leverage uh, uh, funds from Wall Street banks. They don't really get out of bed for anything under a million. Um, the middle markets is what it's called a CRE or small cap is typically 5 million and under from a CRE perspective. Um, and then if you get into home loans, you know, qualifying, you got your, your, your conforming, then your jumbos, right? So there's all these different areas as an investor, as a loan sale advisor, once you hit that, that million dollar UPB typically, or million dollar acquisition is where the funds can get active. Sometimes they'll go below, but if you're a fund manager, you're like, Hey, I got a hundred million to put out. Right. And they've been sitting on this cash for some of them for a few years. You know, I, I, I can't, they can't waste their time on stuff under a million because they're just never going to get all that cash out at that level. Yeah. And, and, the, and the cost for due diligence and things like that kind of offset, you know, we had uh, our buddy Todd Billion, uh, Todd Billings from U.S. Debt Ventures just down the road from me there in Fort Lauderdale speaking as well, talking about, you know, he's got a, a, a you know, a hundred million line of credit, basically, you know, credit mm -hmm. desk. You know, he's got to put that to work. If you're nickel and diamond on some of that smaller stuff, he's like, it just doesn't make sense. The actually moving to the bigger spot yes. actually works well because there's it's rarefied air in a lot of cases. You know, yes. And 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 what we also noticed and what we kind of built our platform because we saw this time after time again in um in, at at, at auction.com right where we're also going to see like thousands of assets trading live which ones close which ones don't. And then we were the guys who literally had to open the hood on every single one of them um, and be like, what happened? How, how do we put the pieces back together and what's it worth? You know, and back in, you know, starting in 2012 where the market finally started, um, you know, you had, you actually had comps, right? Hey, things are getting better. Bankers are lending again. Um, but before that it was really tough. And, you know, I did consulting advising through there. Um, but the thing we noticed most and what we designed the technology of our platform for is it's that whole main street investor, which I'm guessing is mostly your audience. Even if they are funds, they're probably looking at the main street level, main street localized or regional folks with boots on ground operations and Intel and experience and knowledge, right? They will almost always beat the funds, the large funds. Number one, the funds are almost always going to have to hire a third party manager because, you know, where, where all the funds are always their coastal cities and then down in Texas, right? So if they want to, you know, we sold one, we sold one, it was like a small, like $15,000 um, uh, REO property in, um, it was a town in Charlotte. I, I don't even remember the name of the town. I never heard of it before. There was like 3,000 people there. It was a former church. Then it went to a seafood restaurant and you're just like, and I just wanted to help this lender who is a subsidiary of every bank. You know, a fund isn't going to touch that. Your, your, um, your audience, they can get that. They can easily, you know, minimum 20% to 200% returns and typically six to 18 months, however quickly you can stabilize and recapitalize uh, the asset. Yeah, that's, that's the biggest thing, you know, when Fannie a couple of years ago was stopped and you know, when their number of REOs started fading off because they were selling you know, primarily on the debt space, selling the loans off to Goldman Sachs and a bunch of others and other investors, you know, they announced like, we're going to not be selling any, many REOs because we're selling these, the notes to the investors or the funds because they can be a lot more flexible with it. They can cash this out in a much quicker space so that we can go out and take that money and recapitalize it, you know, the velocity of capital and we're lending out. Velocity right. capital, yep. Yeah. So, Mike, let's, let's talk a little bit about something here. I mean, you've been doing this for a while. What was your feeling on the commercial space before our, you know, our, you know, our favorite uncle Captain Tricks, you know, kind of rolled in here with the pandemic and, you know, the coronavirus. Did you think, I mean, the, the commercial markets were going strong, a little overpriced in some sectors. What'd you kind of see before everything kind of happened? Yeah. So we saw things getting heated. Uh, we did, I did a conference uh, where we, 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 you know, I was a speaker there uh, at the IMN uh, down in Miami, I think it was in 20, early 20, 19 so almost about 15 months ago where we specifically there, there is one key um indicator right everybody watches gdp where's the dow jones you know which is basically just apple amazon google all that yep. stuff um and then they'll look at unemployment and then prime rates right that's very important for the consumer economy but you know you you even touched on it you said velocity of capital or velocity of money as we say like these are all things that are you know also indicators 
I, I banked on what's called the yield curve inversion. Um, when the yield curve inverts, that basically in the debt market is, and anyone you know listening to note closers, uh, we close notes, we close notes. Sorry, um, you know that the debt markets dwarf the equities. So, and the debt is you know um, they're the one who determine pricing, especially in real estate, because you know the, the valuation is primarily driven by rates and, and availability of uh, capital liquidity. So when we saw that yield curve invert, that means that everyone in that debt game is now not going short in midterm. You know, they're not buying one year bonds or, or two year or even three year bonds. Um, and now they're going heavy into five, seven, 10 and longer durations because they see that time as there's greater risk line ahead and we're not getting compensated for it. They're, that's why that yield goes up, right? And then the yield curve on the long side goes down and it inverts. Typically, it's supposed to be a nice solid curve. The further you got, the more risk you see, right? Because you can't control the future 30 years, but you control right. the next 30 days a bit better. So when that yield curve inverted, uh, started to invert, and there's, it's never been wrong. Never been wrong in history. Uh, it only came out in the 80s. They reverse tested. Uh, it came out um, you know, positive uh, for a recession will kick off within six to 12 months following a yield curve reversion. So that was the key indicator. Um, we, I knew we were also, uh, and we also watched the CPPI, Commercial Property Price Index, which is uh, published uh, by a really great firm, um, which name is escaping me, right? Green Street Advisors, Green Street Advisors. Um, I think they're based out of Canada or Europe, um, but they have a CPPI. Everyone can access it. Um, when I last checked, we were at about 120, so 20% higher than peak pricing uh, achieved in 07 and 08. And I think it's it's fallen precipitously um, since the COVID crisis, which, you know, those guys have to forecast things right. There haven't been enough transactions. Uh, and now it's kind of like this really, really weird, um, wide bid ask uh, spread. So this is kind of the musical chairs. Everyone's getting ready for it. Some people are piling their cash into core assets. We've got a lot of investors right now. Um, you know, we had guys who lost a lot of money in the market. Where do I put my capital? Best thing to do, buy something cheap that's already, you know, buy something salvage value, right? So they, they're coming to us to get scratch and debt NPLs and REO. That makes a lot of sense there. Cause you know, we, I see it here on, on uh, the investor side with a lot of people, especially on our apartment syndicators where apartment complexes, I think were the most overpriced asset out there, people flocking and overpaying for these things with the philosophy that, Oh, if I were to buy the market, we're going to regentrify this asset in three years and then cash out. Yeah. We get refinanced out and it, it completely like I'm having my spidey sense go off like it was back in 2008, nine and 10. Yeah. So many people, investors got burned doing the same thing. Oh yeah. We're going to hold on to this. Well, in three years, you can't get refinanced because the values have dropped. You've got to bring 20 to 25% percent of cash back to the table to re uh, securitize that asset for the lenders on yes. things like that. So we see a lot of people now that, that overpriced, Asset class, like, uh, going the, you know, as I like to say, the oh shit factor, what do I do now? But you, you hit the nail on the head there. Buy something of value, discounted, need some work, and then put it to work to recapitalize on that asset. If you can pick it up at 50 cents or 60 cents, it's still got some underlying uh, value in the, in the open market once you've, you yep. know, put new renters in it or new tenants in place on the commercial space, right? Yeah, absolutely. Man, you hit, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, it, it, last cycle we got, and, and this is another thing, um, because, and, and this is probably the, the part that took us a while to understand. And, 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 you know, we realized this years ago, which is why we're kind of, and this is why I'm dealing um, more with NPNs, which I, I refer to as the residential side of the non-performing loan or non-performing mortgage space. And then NPLs, non-performing loans, uh, is like more the commercial CRE side. Uh, we got involved, you know, so, you know, we, uh, we helped founded auction.com finance um, back in, oh man, when was that? I think it was 2014. Um, and some of the folks that um, were on, you know, that, that funded or I should say participated in that venture uh, within auction.com and auction.com commercial prior to converting 10X, they were selling a house on auction.com every single six minutes, every six minutes, like clockwork. And they came from the resi side saying, we need to figure out how to finance these. So they came over to us since we were kind of like the capital markets guy there. We, we started auction.com finance. I didn't know anything about financing homes. Um, and I know that when you do, you, you, you know, with technically qualifying more, there's a lot more regulations. So I said, hey, figure out a way to make commercial loans on these houses 
because commercial loans have a lot less regulations, right? And then you can pay yourself as a broker, as a third party intermediary using OPM, other people's money. So if you do that on a resi side, now you got to go get registered with NMLS, which, you know, are, are we, I have a, we have a broker here. Um, my co-founder, he has that license. Um, but I don't want to touch regulations, right? Because that means other people, there's a lot of people involved and you just don't, I don't want the government involved in how I make money, right? Because it'll take too long. Um, so that's, I, I believe, was kind of where the whole SFR market came out. Now, when you guys hear SFR, you probably think single family residential, which is true. Um, and that's why it's this really interesting, um, um, I guess you can say like um, hub where uh, all the commercial and all of the resi stuff meets. So SFR is now single family rental loan. It's a commercial loan. Um, we're working with some of the largest securitizers and special servicers to sell this stuff. And it is, there's going to be a ton of it because just like you said, they're, they're not, there's, there, there's, um, there's a lot of work going into foreclosing these, like you said, with the Fannie situation where they're like, why, why would a securitized lender go to try to foreclose a $50,000 note? You're, ne you're, you gotta pay third party. You're gonna let the local guys get the note and let them figure it out. Um, let the local attorneys, local landlords, and local contractors um, help. And they know, and this is why I'm very passionate about this, because non-performing loans is it's about recapitalizing assets, opportunities, and communities. And when the big banks and the big funds are involved, especially on these deals under, under a million, they are not going to be better at it than the guys that are there with equity in their, their, their communities and the bankers as well. So that's what we really uh, focused on and are trying to help service. And we know that you, uh, Scott, and your users or, or your, your, your audience, that's why I want to get this message out to them, that this stuff's coming up. Um, it's going to be a lot like Resi, but it's going to be a little bit more like commercial. And we want to help um, facilitate this process to make sure we're, we're recapitalizing these communities uh, in the best way possible. Yeah, I, lo I love that. Uh, I definitely love that. And I think we've got a lot of opportunity out there. Let's, uh, let's take it back a little bit here to the uh, CMBS meltdown, the $50 billion uh, lost overnight here in uh, the middle of March, you know, for the most part. A lot of people flipping out, a lot of people losing value if they reacted in a scarcity factor. I think those markets will recover. It's just going to take a while for everything to kind of settle out and see where everything's trading at, what the government's going to end up doing with bailouts too, right? Do you, do you agree with that or do you have a different opinion about that, Michael? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, man, CMBS, you know, I, number one, don't ever feel bad for CMBS lenders. They, uh, they do it. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of good buddies. I got a lot of good colleagues that we've, you know, I, we got our, our, our behinds kicked in, uh, in 06 and 07 by CMBS. And, you know, when we were a life co lender and, and I, you know, I didn't really understand what was going on. I was just a, you know, I was an analyst, um, you know, fresh out of college green and just knew I was in a safe space. Cause I was like, Hey, they're, they're they had the balance sheet. Um, you know, and, and guys would leave, you know, would not take us like, Hey, you know, your lender, we're the guy same guy who did your loan is going to be here. Right. And we know your mortgage broker, Tom, Tom broker down in, 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 in Dallas. Right. Um, and they would take the CMBS deal for, you know, 10, 10 bips spread tighter. Um, you know, so CMBS, you know, it's not going to be the same cycles last time. Here's and everybody thinks, Hey, yeah, the, the special servicers, right? LNR, Rialto, uh, CW, C3, right? Oh man, get those big CMBS deals and all oh, Fannie Freddie. It's not going to be like that this time. And here's the difference. Why CMBS, which is called CMBS 2.0. Uh, it wasn't very, it, there was a lot more regulations, um, that basically required, and you can talk about either a vertical or a horizontal holdback. So now before CMBS was just turning and burning, man, turning and burning the 1.0, they had, if the deal went bad, too bad. And then auction.com through LNR, who was the special servicer and um, typically what's called like um, the B piece position. They buy the lowest uh, 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 securitized tranche, right? You got your triple A's, your A, and then you got your B tranche which is called your controlling class. So when something goes, goes wrong, right? The captain's drunk and he's about to crash a ship. The first mate jumps in, the B piece investor and a special servicer to basically figure out what the heck are we gonna do? So that's why they, they, they kind of created auction.com and got you know first of its kind, first market, five points to sell the asset. So if you can make five, you already got all your special servicing fees, you got a B piece, Okay, cool. I know my offer. I'm going to get made whole. Hey, bond piece buyers, you know, take this offer. And then I get 5% to my own fund on top of that. 
that is, sorry, I got another call coming in here. Um, that is what happened last time. That's all changed. They can no longer, goodness gracious. Sorry about that. Um, right. They're still there, cut for a second. Sorry. Uh, they shouldn't be calling me. I'm, I don't. I don't run the trading desk. That's my. Uh, that's Andre. Um, so this time around, because of that holdback and because they are not going to be able to make, get a fee for the sale, like to themselves, right? They may be able to get paid like a sales fee or something internally as a special servicer. That's not going to happen again. So they are going to be more inclined to handle this, right? It went from a cash basis to more of an accrual basis, much like banking, to where they're going to try to mark it down steadily. Um, you know, quarter by quarter, maybe quarterly or semi-annual appraisals. So the CMBS stuff and everything in CMBS, man, it's, it's there for a reason, guys. Okay. CMBS gets over aggressive. It always gets overextended um, because the banks and the life codes and Fannie and Freddie won't do it. Right. So CMBS, it's, um, you know, it's got that layer of anonymity. It'll be much in, more interesting this time because now the, uh, the, the originators and the servicers got a, you know, they've got a lot more, um, I guess you could say, um, accountability. So sorry for the long winded answer. I've talked to a lot of guys that run these special servicers. You know, these are the guys that are like, yeah, this is, this is going to be how it goes from now on. So mm -hmm. if you're in consulting and you're doing BOVs and you're doing uh, property management, special asset management, um, it's going to be great for consultants. If you're trying to sell as a broker, it's going to be a lot tougher. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that we did uh, when it first kind of came out is I went on back and pulled up the top 12 uh, first quarter reports from those companies on what they had, you know, what they were sharing with their investors and the top 11 of them all had in the last year invested in a lot of non-performing assets or subprime mortgages as well recently that were, oh yeah, we think we can get it reperforming. I'm like, well, not right now. You're going to have a lot of forbearance agreements here the next six to 12 months, you know? And so that's kind of, that's kind of where I want to take us next year. We look at what's going to happen over time here. We got to still figure out where everything's at in the next 90 days for the most part. If, if you had money that you were uh, investing yourself and there was an asset class that you thought that was going to come out ahead, what, what, what would you, what would you be invested in your dollar in right now, Michael? You're muted yourself. Hang on. Say something now. Are you there? That phone call messed me up. That's okay. You're good. We can end it. Yeah, there. I got it connected to my, my voice over IP, my cell phone and my PC all at the oh, same time. Don't worry about it. Um, yes. Yeah, so, and, and, if, and I cut out a little bit. Which, which, which sector, which sector? Yeah, yeah let me repeat, repeat the question. So basically, right. yeah, if you've got a few millions sitting on the sidelines and you know in the market, feeling the pulse, where would you start looking to invest your money? Is there a specific asset class here in the next 90, uh, 90 days to six months that you'd be dropping your, your money into? Yeah, so you said a, a, a few really cool key things there. The, the forbearance stuff is a major issue. You got policy risk, right? And then you got headline risk too. You're like, hey, you, you go buy an asset, a CMBS deal, right? You know, you got uh, headline risk. Who are you dealing with? And, and people are getting blown up in the media now, right? And if you kind of don't, um, you know, get on board with the mainstream narrative, you know, you might find some trouble. So where do I go to seek safe returns, right? I, obviously, if you're in the NPL game, I think that's probably the safest bet to make right now. Um, in You want to be in states that are landlord friendly, okay? Let's be honest. They're, they're not going to uh, put a moratorium or a permanent moratorium or forbearance or rent holiday if that happens, it's going to be in New York, New Jersey, Chicago, and um, the West Coast, right? Um, and we've been researching this very uh, specifically. And, and it's really, you know, it's really, sorry, it's really tough because the same foreclosure, forbearance, and payment, it, it's the same that applies to people's houses that it does to their businesses, right? And the same funds get the same protection as a lot of these residential folks. Um, Focus on states that are landlord friendly, uh, property rights friendly. Um, if you're buying MPLs, man, Georgia and Texas, Georgia, Texas, and Florida, those are the top three states. I don't know why Florida, I think because it's, we, there's just so many people coming down here all the time that yeah. real estate, even if it goes down and it, it is a very uh, efficient marketplace, it'll get ahead faster than the others. It'll collapse faster than the others, but it'll also come back just because we have so many brokers down here. 
Um, so I would say stick to uh, judicial foreclosure or um, um, uh, foreclosure friendly and landlord friendly states. Uh, Texas, non-judicial, 30 days. Georgia, 90 days, non-judicial. And Florida, there's always a ton of demand coming here. Um, and go to where the, the, the go to where the, the, the folks or the consumers are going. Um, also, you may want to focus on what's called, because I don't think we've seen the last of COVID. You know, if you're reading the headlines, it's already focused on, um, you know, the, uh, the, the second phase or, or you know, second wave. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we just sold, man, we just sold, we've got one on a contract right now, OREO from a bank, a small bank out in uh, Postville, Iowa. Have you ever heard of Postville, Iowa, Scott? Or, I yeah. bet there's a lot so, of cornfields. <laughs> yeah, just, <laughs> you're exactly right. So I never heard of Postville, Iowa either till I, I, uh, we ran to a small uh, community savings bank. That's obviously where all the farmers, you know, all that, all that corn, you know, after it turns yellow, it, it goes, turns back into green in the form of money. Um, and they also, that's where they've been feeding their cows. They've got the lar the world's largest uh, kosher beef processing facility in Postville. And they actually export, I believe it's where Israel receives a majority of its beef imports. Wow, I didn't know that. 94% occupied, partial REO, partial NPL. We we're going to get the, uh, the Dean Lude, already had it, you know, uh, uh, executed by the, uh, the, the bank, willing to offer that. The buyer bought it all cash, 30-day uh, close, on a 13 cap on in-place income. And he's got a, a Fannie Mae loan ready to take him out at like, you know, four and a quarter percent. What because, kind of you percentage know, did he pick that up at as far as like LTV, what you can figure out? Yeah, so, well, we were selling it primarily as an REO. Um, so he bought it all cash. Um, the note, and it was a, a construction loan. And what had happened was the, the, the former um, uh, uh, owner – and manager of the kosher beef facility, which obviously it's a small town, you're either you're either husking corn or you're or you're, you're feeding the cows, right? Yeah. Um, so it went bad. It was actually a story on American Greed. Oh, this, I this actually was, remember this. Yeah, so you have heard of Postville. Yes, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All so right. he he ran it into the ground. It was really bad. It was also the largest ice raid bus because he was using primarily uh, illegal uh, immigrants uh, uh, as well as even child labor. Yeah. So, and this is why, and this is exa exactly the textbook story. It went bad. The bank was suffering. They were managing themselves. You know, we had the, uh, the CEO's daughter was showing some of these spaces, right? And, and how are you going to serve your community and that asset, recapitalize that asset? At the same time, banks are, banks are not made to manage real estate. They're mm -hmm. not. I don't want to see that happen because he's better served in his community. He's highest and best use um, within the community. So, you know, look for these little towns. So we were able to recapitalize that asset, um, that opportunity in that community. Uh, a new hedge fund owner bought that, that, that uh, uh, beef process, kosher, kosher beef processing facility. And now, I mean, you see, you know, now we know how in, integral uh, and vital these sort of distribution uh, uh, lines are to our, our, our society. And, and you know, just being able to live your life and being able, you know, I don't want to see empty, I don't want to see empty grocery uh, shelves here. So the workers need somewhere, to, uh, a place to live that's clean, healthy, safe, and well managed, and you know, hopefully uh, that's what we did, and we got. We think we sold it to a really good um, um, uh, owner and manager. Yeah, we saw a lot of that in uh, in smaller towns, especially up in yeah. Indiana, Ohio, around the big three in the audio industry was taking part. You know, especially like Fort Wayne, Anderson, Indiana, yep. were yep. a couple of markets that were hit really hard that we bought some stuff in. And when um, GM was a GM that got taken over, and then kind of rebounded back strong for it as well turn reopening plants, those markets rebounded back very strongly as well too. So yeah, it's important to, to know what's going on in those markets as the major employers and stuff like that. That always makes me think about, you know, what's going to happen in one of these college towns, these university cities where, you know, the, the lifeblood is a university. Like in, uh, in Bloomington, Indiana, they did a piece on how it's basically a ghost town. You think about, well, maybe even like Tallahassee, you're, uh, the, you know, you know, the, uh, the Seminoles aspect of things there, because there's a lot of companies in commercial property that's set there to help cater to their universities or the, you know, the students and the staff that it's going to take a while to recover there. You know, you got to think about that, right? Yeah. So uh, you are absolutely right. So student housing, you know, um, and I want to make sure I answered this, this question good enough. Cause I know I, I, I get into these stories, right. You can tell I'm very passionate about this stuff. I, I love this. I, I don't ever want to do anything else with my life. This is, this is my calling. This is my passion, my purpose. I'm um, just trying to walk my path, you know? Um, so, you know, I think these rural towns, um, if you can look for um, assets and sort of opportunities that are, you know, are either directly tied or somewhat related 
to um, what are they calling it? All my families, they're, they're calling it. What is it when you when you're like integral staff? Like they all had passes during the lockdowns. Oh, essential, essential, essential. Business. Yeah, essential businesses. Be close to that if you can. If you want to have more of a you know COVID thing. Um, right now. And there are a lot of opportunities that aren't priced. You know, people still want to buy an apartment in Manhattan on a five cap. It's like, well, I got Postville, Iowa on a 13 cap and no one's shutting the beef processing facility down. Right. How can you buy anything cheaper? Right. 94% occupied. It's insane. Um, and then um, in terms of like where I think the, it's going to get hit the hardest SFR loans, uh, specifically um, uh, private lenders, private lenders are not going to get bailed out. Okay. Yeah. Banks, Fannie, Freddie um, folks, you know, um, the, the, um, the originators, QM uh, loan originators, like Quicken loans down in Detroit. Hey man, if Quicken loans goes, Detroit's going to collapse again. Right. Let's be honest. Um, don't yeah, ask guess, me how, don't ask me how I know. <laughs> well, I'll tell you how I know because of uh, the guy behind Quicken loans, he owns the Cavaliers. I mean, he's dropped, millions if not yep. a B into the redevelopment of Detroit and yep. you know Quicken's been selling their stuff on a quarterly basis for years you know we've been looking at their stuff but that's the thing is those areas like you know Cleveland's going to be hit hard Detroit yep. has been trying to come back there but they don't it's still though you know it's still been one of the most affordable things you know that being part of the legacy platform where you could buy houses for 500 to 1500 bucks they were giving them away they were giving them away yeah. during the downturn yeah um yeah so um and when we've done a lot of research on um the top 50 and top 100 msas um for our real estate you know loan sales analytical capital markets perspective cleveland should be good the in interior core and that whole area in ohio because you got um and in indiana i believe as well i, I want to say in ohio you got a lot of um the what is it called? The Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga County, Cuyahoga River. Yeah, Cuyahoga you know, they, County is, yeah. is, is where uh, Cleveland is. And then you've got, uh, oh, the county um, where uh, Columbus is. Columbus has been, you know, Columbus, yep. Ohio, where the Ohio yep. State University is. Yeah. yeah. So if you look there, I mean, and we noticed this trend, especially at auction, like, man, no one built any, any, any housing there since the 70s. It's all old. It's all wood frame. Um, so now, you know, Cleveland kind of came, came around and it's, it's really funny because it's been a trend in America about reestablishing and, you know, revitalizing and fully integrating your core and everyone got off of manufacturing. Cause you know, I mean, manufacturing was, was the death sentence for, for Cleveland and the river that set on fire, like, you know, decades ago. So now they're focusing on medical, uh, Indianapolis is focusing on tech and distribution, which is really good and driving that area as well as Fort Wayne. Um, man. The, the, the area, so in terms of regions to go, if you want to, you know, if you just want to be, hey, I want a safe investment, foreclosure friendly landlord and property rights friendly states. If you want insane risk and the places that are going to be selling off, man, Cook County is going down hard, hard, okay? A lot of that, there's a pressure release system in, in Cook County, and that's called Lake County, Indiana. So if you want to go buy SFR in Lake County, Indiana, my, my brother-in-law does, which is why I got a really good insight into it. That's where you want to go buy. If it's already happening, Chicago, Cook County guys, they're going to be an exodus from these places as capital. Hey, you're not respecting my rights, my property rights. I'm going to take my money and leave. So I know firsthand experience about Cook County. Hang on a second. <laughs> I know. I'm, not, <laughs> I'm looking over my shoulder as we speak. And I got a, where did my hat go? I got, you know, I got really good intel. Clark, Clark Street Capital, right? He, he's a really good guy. He, he runs that town. Um, but uh, and I've did I've done some uh, some 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 deals there. We we've taken a look there. You know Cook County. If you're an out of towner trying to get into Cook County, man, good luck. But if you want to buy rent, you, you can you got to find a localized partner there who who's got obviously connections. I like Lake County, but it is starting to, um, you know, they're starting. You know, they're running out. The, the rats are jumping out of the ship, and uh, <laughs> you know they maybe maybe Page County there in in Illinois as well. You got Lake and DuPage. Because yep. it's so difficult to foreclose in, in, in Cook County. It's so corrupt. And so that's why those areas across, I mean, yeah, you got to have a local, if you're going to do it, you got to be local. hundred yeah, percent. You got to be local. You got to have local connections, man. I, um, we've, we've done quite a few deals there. I don't, I go to Chicago every year. Um, I got family there that I go for this there for Christmas, which is just such a great time to be there. Um, but yeah, it, it is tough, man. We've gotten, um, it, it's, it's tough. If you're out of town, I, I would say stay, stay out of town. If you, if you really want risk, um, New Jersey, you know, that's another one where the taxes are going to keep going up. Values are going to keep going down jobs and wages are going to keep going down. You know, they chase Amazon out of New York. 
Um, you know, and New, and, and New Jersey has, you know, it's historic. I'm from New Jersey, right outside of Philly. It's got that whole uh, pressure release valve for high prices, right? That's how it all started. Everyone left across, you know, Holland Tunnel and uh, uh, George Washington Bridge, right, um, to go get cheaper housing in New Jersey. And now it's, it's the same policies that are driving everybody down to Florida and Texas. Same thing in LA, San Fran, uh, and, you know, California isn't just LA and San Fran, you know, people don't understand that. But, um, you know, they're not respecting, you know, the landlord's property rights. So if you're looking to buy it at the bottom, just keep your eye on those economies because they, you know, America will prevail and, you know, order will be reestablished, but people are going to cut and run early. And that's a perfect time to go in if you want to be focused on the mid to long term and you want higher risk, higher rewards, higher returns. Um, Texas, Georgia and Florida, if you just want to be safe and know that you're going to have governments that are going to respect property rights. Yeah, I'm a big fan of God's waiting room, as I call Florida. Uh, <laughs> Naples, Naples, to be more specific. You know, I spent a lot of time when I was traveling for basically three and a half years nonstop. I spent a lot of time down in Naples or even right across the bridge on uh, Tamiami Trail in Marco Island, yeah, Florida. Out there, the beautiful, high, the high beautiful there. Beautiful area, yes. Did you get to do any fishing? Oh, heck yeah, man. I lived you can right, see right the to the bottom, man. Yeah, Took yeah, I love the, it. The, you know, the Marco River that comes through there. And, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, that, it's, it's great. But that's, let's talk about Florida a little bit because it... it, it I am it, Florida it, man. Yeah, I know you are <laughs> down there. You know, you think back uh, back in 2009-10 where they yeah. thought that at least 30% of the state was vacant. You know, you think about the image, especially from uh, the big short, you know, them yep. walking through these vacant housing complexes that were half built up and you know, only one house is finished or gators in the pools and all that stuff there. But that's, you know, I remember walking into Naples, actually apartment complex, 180 units um, in Santa, five Santa Maria or Santa Anna. I actually know the address there. Naples, still yeah, place. yeah. Okay. Cool. Half of it's rented out. The other half is vacant. The uh, community center's trashed out because it was on the second, it was two loans. And so complete dysfunctional property area. But mm -hmm. Florida was at such a big discount. I mean, I used, I would not pay. I actually was looking at a, uh, perspectives that I put together in a portfolio that I wouldn't pay above 40% of as is value. And that included back taxes. Yep. Now these days people would, you know, people would gladly pay 60, 70 cents a dollar because the market rebounded back strong, but I think it's going to take a hit. You know, um, you start looking at the last areas to recover, which was really kind of Jacksonville was kind of the slowest to recover and start kind of rolling it down. Duval County. Yes. Duval yep. County, Hillsborough County a little bit there, but I think, you, you know, Miami is going to stay strong, you know, uh, Broward, you're going to have, I think, a bigger hit in the higher end asset class, especially with the condos up the million dollar condos have already been starting to lag for the most part, but oh, yeah. there's so much international money coming in into South Florida too, right, Mike? Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I, I've been down here for a while, you know, I was born in Broward County, Hollywood Memorial back in, back in the eighties. Um, Man, you were you were right there when this stuff was going down last cycle. Yeah, uh, Cape Coral got annihilated. I don't think it's even recovered all the way since. Oh yeah, it has. I've made a lot of money in Cape Coral. I yeah, love yeah, yeah. Western yeah. Cape Coral is like my uh, getaway spot yeah. over there. But like yeah, you, it's nice and quiet. You got, yeah, you got you Cape Coral, Lehigh Acres, you know, Lehigh, um, yep. Bonita Springs, Fort Bragenton, Myers, Fort Sarasota, Myers. Venice. Yeah, yeah. I've uh, and I've lived, you know, I've lived in, um, I've lived in Tallahassee. I've lived in all three counties down here, um, and I lived in Tampa as well. And um, you know, I, I've been, I've been everywhere in this state, man. Almost everywhere. You know, at a, across, you know, sixty from, you know, South Florida to Tampa, you know, just to go see all the orange groves and the citrus. Um, you know, the, Cape, Cape, and you tell me, I would like to know. I, from 06, from peak pricing in, um, in those areas, they, a lot of them haven't gotten back up to 06. Um, maybe close if they're rented or if you're financeable, um, you know, you probably still see some of the foundations lying in the, in the pads, like, you know, on a cul-de-sac. Right? You see a few of those these days. We've got a good uh, buddy of ours, Brent Garris, who's a phenomenal realtor out that neck of the woods. And he, he sold every, he had about 20 houses. He sold them all here in the last six months because he knew, seen the market capped it out. Yeah, and that was our fault. And then I think about we were, uh, golly, a year and a half ago, Bayview sent us yeah, a portfolio. Bayview. They're down, they're uh, down here now, Cape Coral, uh, uh, Coral Gables. Coral Gables, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I make that same mistake going to Cape Coral, Coral Gables. It's easy to do. Yeah. But they sent me a list of their Florida stuff that they were performing that they were selling basically two years ago at eighty cents of UPB. I was like, what are they doing? Performing stuff right now? You're letting go? 
Is it because you see like, what's going on here? Is it because you bought it at 40 cents three, you know, five years ago and you think you've got as much as you can get out of it? Ooh. Yeah. 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 Well, well, they'll, you know, they're, they're a really interesting. So they're another one of those private lenders. They're not going to get bailed out and they've been running their other uh, silver Hill uh, mortgage fund. And, and we got some, some good colleagues and friends over there. Um, you know, they're very well capitalized, so yeah. they can weather just about any storm, and they know no one's coming to save them, right? Um, but more specifically, too, um, what's going to happen in Florida? Man, I don't know. I, Fl- Florida is the, I mean, you know, everyone's like, hey, um, it, it was funny. It's like I, I saw a good meme on, a, on Instagram that said, hey, if you had to get rid of one state in the United States, which one would it be and why is it Florida? <laughs> Because it's like, it's. <laughs> I don't know. I love Florida. I've always thought it was much better than California when it comes to a lot of things out there. California. Yeah, is- yeah. For for, yeah. for property rights too. I I just yeah. love it because it is kind of like the wild wild west. It is wide open. Anyone can come down here. It's not like it's not like New Jersey or or Philly or New York or Chicago where you got to be you got to know people and you got to you know play in the politics. You know, obviously there's a little bit of that going down here as, as anywhere, you know, especially like Disney and Orlando and the Brightline railway system coming in. Um, I think Florida in the long term is going to do great. We've got tons of uh, bright, uh, a lot of beach line, right? 40% of the eastern seaboard is along uh, the Florida coast. Yeah. Um, we've got a ton of uh, great universities that keep gaining traction. Yeah. Um, the cost of living is still really low. There's no, especially when there's no income tax. Um, state income tax, sorry. Um, we're, we're, we're building out the infrastructure, which has always lacked infrastructure. Brightline is going to be huge. It's finally happening. They've been talking about it ever since I moved down here. Um, in terms of pricing, man, seeing what's going on in these states, like it, it really is going to be a day by day or, or, you know, mostly measuring in 90 days. If they don't lift moratoriums and open back up those, those, those blue states, all the property owners are coming down here. If they don't respect the rule of law and property rights, they're all going to come down here. They're going to come down to Texas, right? Um, they're not all going to come down to South Florida. That is uh, a very common misperception. Sure, you know, the blue bloods from Chicago will, or, or from uh, DC will, you know, the big time landlords from New York will, but the regular folks who lost their jobs, right? They're going to go to, um, they're going to go to, uh, to Hillsboro, Pasco, Hernando County. They're going to go to Manatee, uh, Manatee County. They're going to go to these cheaper places in Florida. They're going to come down to Fort Lauderdale, but they're not going to live in a class A housing, right? You know, maybe yeah. some of the bankers and stuff will, uh, or some of the landlords, but they're going to go out to Coral Springs, not Coral Gables, <laughs> right? And not, uh, not Cape Coral, Coral Springs, um, you know, which, which was a really great suburb, one of America's top suburbs in the early 90s. Um, so I, I think Miami... Man, I, I don't know because a lot of it, you know, you talk about international money, um, you know, oil got decimated. I, I don't know what's going to happen to Florida. I know that they added way too many high-end units here. I think the high-end units, the high-end condos are going to get crushed. You yeah. will be competing with flight capital. And we saw this happen before. Um, the U.S. government, what's we wrote an article. flight capital for our listeners, Michael? Explain what flight capital is. Flight was. capital. So back in, you guys remember you, you, back in um, uh, the last downturn where everyone was like, oh, the bail-in. Right, the Cyprus government is just going to take it, and the Germans just took their money right out of the accounts and said, "Bail in, right? Because you got all this money, and how dare you hide it in the the, the, the banks, you greedy sons of guns." Um, so they're like, "Hey, I need to get my money out of this country as soon as possible. I don't care what I do. U.S. real estate, Miami real estate. There's tons of other ways to, to get your money in and out of the country, and Miami real estate is one of the preferred methodologies of that." Uh, New York real estate is a little bit high, and now you also see the deflation. Um, a lot of these guys you have, and it's particularly in Miami, you had what's called um, the, the uh, and specifically a flight capital scenario. You know, when when Chavez, um, you know, uh, you know, had his heart attack, and uh, Maduro, Maduro came into power, you had the uh, flight capital of all the families knowing, hey, it's here. They took over uh, and consolidated all the wealth, took kicked out all the uh, the wealth class, right, who controlled all the means of production. They all came to Miami. People, and you talk about headline risk, it made headlines, you know, they were throwing their Cuban coffees at them at, at lunchtime. Like you're a Chavanista or, or you, you made money from Chavez, you, you, you left, you, you, now you own assets here. And more specifically, um, because, you know, we have, you know, bank relationships. Um, I've had several calls. Hey, the FDIC is coming in. They want to know our exposure to yep. Venezuelan assets and Venezuelan uh, citizens, right? So, and that goes back to the whole know your client. 
So the flight capital, they're coming to the U.S., especially as these tensions ride and these trade wars and these tariffs. Hey, you just saw um, Trump was in Maine. I have family up in Maine. Hey, do you know that the Canadians catch the same lobsters in the same waters, get to sell to Europe for no tariffs, and we pay a tariff? Europe, remove the tariff. We're going to tariff your car. So that's good to keep the dollar strong and, and all this stuff and to keep exports because we've got, we're going to have to export more. We're going to have to bring manufacturing jobs back here. Um, Florida, I think, is ahead of the curve. We've got um, uh, really great programs, and we've got cheap land, right? And there's plenty. It's, it's not just Miami here. Miami, I think the Miami is going to get nailed. I think Miami is going to get absolutely rocked. Um, we increased our supply of multifamily housing apartments, not condos this time. Last time was condos. This time was apartments. Um, we increased the overall inventory of multifamily housing by 10% in a single, in a matter of three to five years. That is way, it took us, you know, we were swamp land in the 70s. I-95 I didn't even go touch Miami. And now we just increased that supply that took 30, 40, 50 years to get here. We just increased it by 10% and it's all luxury housing. Yep. It's going to get slammed. So there'll, there'll be plenty of opportunities here. Sorry, I, I went on for quite a bit, but no, we that's here. You no, know, I think people people love that because we do have Florida is one of our bigger markets for our network out there. You know, we've the show plays across a couple of different radio networks mm -hmm. there in Florida and Tampa and in the villages and Newport Riching. The villages. Like, yeah, the villages. Retirement community central. There. Yeah, yeah. That'll be me one day. I will look forward that. to it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But, you know, uh, we've talked about a lot of stuff here, Michael, and I, we could go on. I would love to have you back on in a few months yeah. when kind of things settle out. For Absolutely. what's the best way for our listeners to to check out what you guys have at ex, exchange loans for sale or what's the best way to kind of network with you? Yeah, absolutely. And again, thank you for having me. It's been a great conversation, uh, really eye-opening to what you guys are looking for. I'm trying to learn more about the NPN and the Main Street investors because, you know, that is the majority of the market. You guys are the ones on the front lines recapitalizing assets, opportunities, and communities. And I want to do everything I can to help you because um, I don't want the big funds just to come in and, and you know, you buy something that stays vacant for five years. That doesn't help anybody. Um, so the best way to get in touch with us, email me, mj at exchange.loans, right? There's no .com, no .net, exchange.loans. It is a, a, a subdomain uh, or URL. Um, check out our website, exchange.loans. There's a big pink button up there that says schedule demo. That goes right to my calendar. Um, hit us up on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, guys, LinkedIn is the future. I'm a big believer on LinkedIn. I've gotten, you know, several uh, six-figure uh, trades off of there, off of just, you know, just posting stuff. Um, be active, uh, be present, and, and just be on LinkedIn. Um, and you can always, you know, call me, get, you can email Scott if you want, get a hold of me, come check out exchange.loans. We're in beta test mode. Um, we've got about 25 SFR portfolios coming to market on the exchange.loans platform, hopefully with, uh, hopefully this summer. But uh, things are going to be kicking up into high gear. Q3, Q4, and Q1 are, are, are going to be pretty active. So exchange.loans, MJ at exchange.loans. Awesome, Michael. I appreciate you taking your time on a busy schedule, man. We uh, stay in touch. And actually, uh, LinkedIn is how we originally connected back in the day. Actually, yes. I remember you speaking at IM, and I didn't attend. I was supposed to go, but I saw you. Oh, and yeah. I, oh, I got to reach out to him. And we just connected on LinkedIn over the last couple months. So looking forward to it. Uh, as always, thanks for taking your time. Thanks for speaking at Note Camp as well. Great job. A lot of great compliments on your session there. Thank you. As well, too, for you. So, guys, that's going to wrap it up for this episode. Take heed to what Michael shared. Michael shared a lot of knowledge. You might need to go back in and read the actual article on uh, the website right. once it's up and going. But uh, we look forward to having him back on in the future. So, as Mike said, take advantage. Learn what's going on in the market so that you can capitalize the most, make the most bang for your buck here in the second half of 2020. So, go out, take some action, everybody. And uh, we'll see you all at the top, everybody. Bye. Bye.